Hey everyone, if you are a piano teacher and you've ever wondered if the way you're teaching beginner technique is right, or if you're wondering how other people do it, then today is the video for you. There is lots of different ways of teaching piano technique and if I asked 100 teachers, I would get 100 different answers. However, there are some fundamentals. So in today's video, I'm gonna go through four key fundamentals that I've seen across the board as a standard part of good uh, piano technique or teaching good piano technique. And I'll also give you one bonus, which I'll say at the start because it really shouldn't be actually one that we need to <laughs> include, but I'm gonna include it anyway. Hi, my name is Tim and this is the Top Music Channel where we help music teachers just like you guys uh, teach amazing lessons and run great businesses. And we love doing that with our weekly YouTube videos and blog posts and our podcast. So let's get started. I've always been fascinated about technique and the different ways teachers teach it. Piano has a huge history of pedagogy going back 200 years, so two centuries or more. So there is a wealth of information there, but sometimes it can be really hard to know if the way you are taught, which is often the way we teach, is the right way to actually do it, which method books should you use, what's important. These are all the questions that we're gonna to answer today. So let's go with number one, the most fundamental element of getting technique right at a piano is to make sure your student is sitting at the right height. Now, I've got a whole blog post about this. I've done a whole another video about it, so we'll put links to that. But suffice to say, it's important that they are sitting comfortably forward on their stool at a height whereby when their arms are at the piano, there is a slight uh, that's not quite, quite straight, maybe just a little bit upwards towards their, um, their elbow. And their hands are comfortably at the piano and they can move around. Their feet are flat on the floor. They've got the ability to move around the piano without falling off the bench, but they're not too low like this and they're not way too high like this where their arms are straight. It's so fundamental. And I have to say that the pandemic was a great opportunity for us as teachers to actually see inside the students' practice world, which we sometimes don't get to see. What do they do at home? What instrument are they playing on? Where are they playing their instrument? And it wasn't a surprise to me to find out lots of teachers finally realized why so many of their students were perhaps having issues because they were sitting on their bed playing on a keyboard with only four octaves and really small keys, or they were, you know, lounging and trying to do this while using TikTok in their other hand or whatever it was. So get them set up the right way. That is the most important thing to start with. Now, point number one, this seems to be something that all teachers now agree on, although it wasn't the case maybe only 10 or 20 years ago. And that's that you shouldn't start a piano student off by teaching them a legato touch at the piano first thing. I.e., we don't want to be teaching them and expecting them to play with lovely connected notes like that from the first lesson. And there's a great quote I'm gonna to read to you by Richard Cronister. He was one of the Francis Clark Center's uh, key teachers. And in his book, A Piano Teacher's Legacy, he wrote this about that technique. When a child takes his first lessons in art, his method of drawing is expected to be primitive and the result is unmistakable. It looks like a child's drawing. When a child takes his first piano lessons, his technique of playing is expected to be a sophisticated legato and the result is unmistakable. Flat fingers, thumbs hanging below the keyboard, fingers flying, no real legato. The eternal cry is, curve your fingers. Forcing a child to play legato, to use his hands in a way he has never used them before, may be causing him to develop habits he may never break. So what um, Richard is saying is, if your student tends to have fingers that kind of fly around like this and they can't seem to control things and they may be playing really flat and their thumbs are hanging down, it could be because they were forced into trying to do this legato touch too soon. So what should we be doing instead? That is a non-legato approach. And that is now pretty standard in most of the modern method books, which is great, particularly some of the newer ones and the independent ones like Supersonics and Piano Safari and others. We now advocate a non-legato touch at the piano to start with. So that's where students are not connecting, not trying to connect the sounds together. They are separating the sounds and they're doing each of them in a separate hand movement. And this way, they can start to get a sense of feeling of alignment down the finger, uh, right up into the arm, and a sense of control, and a sense of everything being working as one unit. That's my tip number one. 
Encourage students when they first start playing to use a non-legato touch. They don't have to connect the notes. That can come later on when you start connecting two notes together, then three notes together, and gradually it will build. All right, so let's now talk about uh, point number two, which is to curve the hand naturally. Who of you were taught in your lessons, you must curve your fingers? Curve your fingers. It was pretty common a hundred years ago, and certainly for my, my lessons as well, you were really taught that any sort of flatness to the fingers like this is to be discouraged, and fingers should be brought in to this sort of position here. And that, while, yes, we, we, we don't want to be playing like this, it's very hard to move fast if your fingers are, are spread out compared to being able to move fast like this, but the curve has to be natural. And a lot of times students, when you say curve your fingers, will suddenly go like this and they instantly introduce all this tension. A lot of the times uh, when I've introduced this, it's just to get students to hang their hands down by the sides of their body and just bring them up to the piano. And if you look at what, shape they end up in, it is actually a really naturally curved position. So there they are hanging down by my side. You can see them from the front. If you look at that, that shape, that's the shape that we want on the keyboard. Okay, so that's one way to kind of get the right shape. It should just be a natural shape. We also wanna think about this as being a bridge and this being the strong point of the bridge too. There's a lot of concern amongst teachers about collapsed knuckle joints when fingers kind of bend back like, like this or this. I can't, can't really do it because my fingers are relatively strong. Some students have strange joints and whatever else. That sort of uh, bending back of the knuckle, while it doesn't look very nice to watch, Oftentimes, students do grow out of that as they gain finger strength. Oftentimes, you know, anytime they've pushed on anything in their life, they've let that knuckle bend backwards. So having that strength of the first knuckle can be a real challenge for a lot of students. So that can be something that can be developed over time. So one suggestion for strengthening this hand position and cementing it in the minds of students is to just get them to play a cluster of notes in the right hand position without any sort of stress or strain or anything like that. So I'm just playing the first five notes all adjacent on the keys with my thumb on its corner, quarter of the nail, and the rest of the fingers just together, nice and naturally. And I'm keeping flexibility in my wrist as well. You could also, if the hand's a little bit bigger, you could also try it over E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and B or even C. So we want to try and avoid this happening. We keep that strong bridge there and here. We also don't want the thumb to be lying down on its side. And if I show you that in my left hand, you'll see that, that we also want to try and get the pinky to have uh, a bit of a curve into it and also to be standing upright. So we don't want this. And Richard Cronster mentions this in his book as well. Just getting students to play that as a cluster until it becomes comfortable can be a great way to move from that, oh yes, this is a good shape, but what happens when you actually play the instrument and everything collapses to giving strength to that hand position. In fact, when I was talking to Marvin Blickenstaff about this on my podcast, we'll put a link to that one below, he actually said this was his uh, idea originally. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, the third technique tip out of four is to use gestures and give names to gestures at the piano. And this has become more and more popular with methods like Piano Safari and using something called the Lion Paw or the Rocket Launch from Supersonics meaning this kind of motion off the piano as a rocket launching from the wrist. The whole goal of giving names to some of these gestures is for students to remember them and to also kind of understand them a bit better. For example, the lion paw in Piano Safari, which is designed to, to help students understand the weight of the arm and on how all of this uh, is all interlinked, um, is, a, is a kind of natural thing for a child to understand. You say, okay, I want you to, I'm just gonna hold your hold your arm up and I want you to drop it as if it was a big heavy lion paw and I will just do this. And that's, you know, that's the kind of the weight that we want to put into our, our arm if we want an arm weight style of playing. Back when I was a kid, I don't know about you, we were told to, you know, drop and float or sighing and words like this, which I don't think 
has nearly as much connection in a child's mind as something like a lion paw or a rocket launch. So congratulations to the Piano Safari guys, Daniel McFarlane at Supersonics, and there are lots of others who give analogies and names to these kind of movements that we want students to have at the piano. So the whole goal of, of these gestures and these movements that we might call rocket ship or lion paw or sighing or drop float or whatever it is, is to try and help students be able to play with a relaxed wrist, but a firm tone and an interconnection between all the parts of their arm and their hands. They should be able to lift off notes gently and be able to eventually start combining two notes into a two note slur. And eventually two and three, fingers two and three, or three and four. So we have that strong, weak emphasis that often comes up in music and allows us to shape phrases so that we have the end of a phrase. And we know to shape off and taper the sound at the end of the phrase. So they're great things for students to practice. And they don't have to always do that on adjacent notes. They could do uh, upper third. You could do upper fifth. And what we're starting to do here when we're moving between one and five is we're starting to introduce the fourth tip which is to talk about rotation. So I was never taught about rotation, this idea of the wrist having to move when I was a piano student and I think that was probably something that was missed for me because I did get some tension in my playing when I started to get to more advanced repertoire. Uh, ultimately this is one of the fastest movements that the hand and the arm can do. Uh, and so when we're trilling and we want to trill quickly, there's an element of rotation in there. It's just a very, very minor movement once we get to a fast motion of trills. But at a slow motion, we want students to be able to understand that there's a rotation of the wrist going on. And uh, Dorothy Taub Taubin of the Taubin approach, this is one of the first times I was really introduced to this uh, as, an, as an adult. What it does is allow some freedom of movement. And there's a lot of argument about whether we should use the word relaxation in piano technique, because to be ultimately to be completely relaxed, I, you know, I'd have to be like this, or I'd be playing like this. That's to total relaxation. So we're not talking about that. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a specialist in the Taubman technique uh, at all. But what I do know is that yes, while we want to have some sense of relaxation, it's more about freedom of movement. And that comes with having subtlety in the wrist and also in the rotation movements. So having students when they're first learning to move between fifths, for example, and rather than just do it all in the fingers, to allow the wrist to move is an important factor. And, and for Alberti basses. And I was, I was always taught too, that a lot of the time when you're looking at specific technical movements at an instrument like this, at a slow pace, it's not a bad thing to exaggerate the movement. So for example, moving quite quickly here, uh, moving large movements in my wrist as I rotate. But as the motion gets faster, the movement minimizes. But if you've done the work early on to build that into your playing system, then that will become naturally part of the movement, even at a faster pace when you can't actually see it happening. Now, I've got lots of uh, other videos on technique. You can see me having lessons at an advanced level with the amazing Fred Karpov of Entrada Piano uh, over on this YouTube channel. There's some live stream lessons there. And I would love to continue the discussion. So what do you think about those four tips? Well, and that bonus one at the beginning. What's most important to you? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? There's gonna be lots of discussion around this, I'm sure. So leave a comment below, I would love to read it. And as always, make sure you hit that subscribe button at the top and I look forward to seeing you in our next video.